Oh. I'm about to try and do that. Are you not trying you're not trying to be on the the, the recording? No, sir. <laughs> uh, you're gonna have to exit stage left because the button has been pressed. All right. <laughs> Here we go. We're gonna chop it up. <laughs> All right. Come on, man. Come on, hey, man. All right, he's gone. So All right, the food. it just leaves the two of us. All right. Uh Ron and Ron. What's up, everybody? I don't know what I'm gonna call this or if I'm gonna even call it anything, but uh, my first live interview is with the one, the only, Ron Hortman Jr. Uh, this is my uh, my uh, oldest son. Uh, I'll I'll let him tell a little bit about himself. Uh, I'll give you a little backstory. Uh, he was born when I was a teenager, and uh, you got to see the trials and tribulations of a young black couple trying to make it. And he is the product of my, my labor, shall I say. When they say you want your labor to be in vain, ladies and gentlemen, Ron Horman Jr. <laughs> How y'all doing, America? Uh, Ron Horman Jr. Um, now I don't know what you want me to tell him, Mike. Well, I, I'm gonna ask you some questions. Uh, okay. Just, just because, uh, you know, uh, we have a very unique uh, story, I'll say. Uh, you are the uh, oldest of four, and uh, being born to teenage parents, and I, one could say that we were very immature. How, how do you, and you can be perfectly honest, there's, <laughs> this is no hold bar. Right. How do you feel like when you look at your peers? and your friends and their family and their parents compared to how you were raised? Like, what would be your, uh, your, your, your perception? Mm, my perception. Even though my parents were young, and whenever I would, uh, whenever my parents would meet my friend, my peers' parents, my peers' parents, well, his parents are so young, they're so young, they say stuff like that. And I, me, I'm thinking their parents are so old. <laughs> but you know, it's kind of now. It's kind of like looking back. If you look over, like from Rihanna looking, if Rihanna friends come around, and y'all had that one young friend, or I don't know, they just they could they could look at y'all the same way. But a lot of my friends, even though they they parents were older, I I appreciate growing up with my parents like the way we did, and the 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 things I was taught and the things that you instilled in us. I I take I'll take it for granted. So I've seen a lot of people who lack like a lot of consideration and accountability and stuff like that. So even though they their parents might have been older, it's like some people still kind of missed out. But it ain't it ain't to talk down on nobody or nothing like that. It's just I'm happy where I come from. Um, I have no shame, no shame in it whatsoever. That makes me so proud. Makes me so proud, so proud. Now listen, uh, now part of it, it, this is not about me or uh, it's about you per se, but we we are so intertwined as a as a family. So uh, some of these questions are like me, uh, just getting your perspective. Like be, being a t teenage parent, uh, you know, it was a little rough being that you were born with a condition. I don't know if you want to talk about it or not. If you want to pass, we can pass. No, uh, good. But okay. So being that you were born with a with a condition that makes you different from the average uh person your age. Uh and being a parent, it happened to me twice. So, you know, I felt horrible, you know, I, I don't know why I felt like why did God choose us for this? But mm -hmm. Explain your condition a little bit and how it, how it affected you growing up. Like I, I've never heard, like I know your your perception. I guess I can say, but I never heard it directly from your mouth. In a uh, shall I say, as an adult <laughs> talking to another adult so, yeah, from an adult perspective, adult point of view. Got you, got you. Um, the condition I have is sickle cell anemia. It's a rare blood disease that affects 
the way I intake oxygen, the way my blood cells carry carry oxygen, basically. So it causes me to sometimes miss weeks at a time of school. It causes excruciating pain in my body and it causes me to be hospitalized from time to time. And it's, it's a lot that comes with it. It's a lot that comes with it. But one thing I, I'm really appreciative or appreciative of is when I was in those hospitals and I was going, like I would be sick at home when I was out of school, my mom and my dad were always there, were always there to always have my back. Even if the doctor said something that they disagreed with, they will always be there to stand up for me and stick up for me. So it made me feel comforted. So even though I was different from my peers, I couldn't play sports and stuff like that. Yeah, the, the way you and mama, the way you and mama nurtured me and always kept giving me like positive things to grow up. I don't have to be, I don't have to have a strong body if I have a strong mind. And it, it just pushed me to take things a lot further, not to be, not to be held back by stuff like that. Because now people, are, I'm so proud of you, so resilient and stuff like that. But I don't even look at it like that. I just look at it. That's how I was raised. Just keep going, not to dwell on what I can't control, just to keep going. So. I, I I don't take it for granted at all. And then Rihanna, when Rihanna having it as well, it's like y'all didn't know. We all didn't know when I, when I had it. We all didn't know. Like we didn't know what to do. Y'all didn't. <laughs> I was learning as we was going. Right. Like, we started to get a system down pat and getting stuff together for when Rihanna was coming into the world and she, but her we're basically helping her deal with hers because I can give her some type of feedback or something. But it's just it was just always nice to have you and mom there because. I hated being, I hated when adults, peers, or any or teachers, anybody would sell me short just because of my condition or treat me different because of my condition or wouldn't let me participate in certain stuff because of my condition. So the fact that my parents gave me that resilience that I could still forget what they got going on, I was confident enough of myself to keep pursuing my dreams and what I want to do. That don't stop nothing from me. So I'm very appreciative of it. So uh, that that will lead me right to my next question. Do do you feel that because of your condition, uh, compared to your to your other two brothers, that we treat you differently? No, no, I don't think you treat us differently. I think you treat us accordingly. My my other two brothers, they they love to they especially love to play sports or stuff like that. Be be kind of active and stuff, and it's that's something that I can't participate in then you didn't take that away from me or made me feel any less of a man or feel any less love because we were supporting my brother in his basketball endeavors or supporting my other brother in his sports or whatever he wanted to do. So I've never, I never felt like that. I never felt like y'all treated us different. I always just felt like y'all treated us accordingly because we all are own. We did, we all the same, but we different. We got all different personalities. So. I, this guy's pretty good, y'all. This guy is pretty good, <laughs> if I do say so myself. Now, uh, we 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 are originally from uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, me and myself, I grew up in the uh, inner city, and I went to a uh, suburban school all the way through high school. Shout out to Brown Deer High School. Uh, I'm a Falcon forever. Uh, but we left Milwaukee, moved to Newport Ritchie, Florida, where we first saw cows, right? I never never seen cows. We had cows around the corner from our house. How did us taking you out of that that environment to a completely different environment and some of the things that happened? Like, I don't I don't want to tell the stories from my point of view. I want you to tell a story or two about uh when we moved down here. When we moved here. And then to follow up, I'm gonna lead right into answer that first. Answer that first. Okay. Well the first the first just a couple of stories that come to mind like that when we moved down here. But I mean when we was leaving at first we really didn't want to go, but it was after y'all came back from your anniversary and uh we ended up moving down, yeah, I remember that and uh starting school I'm switching going from like a more diverse school, more more culturally diverse school to come into an all white, all white school and being the only black kid at home or homeroom or in a lot of your classes or me and my brother the only black kids on the bus and stuff like that. So it just it came with a lot because it, I don't think they they was just like shocked to see some of us or just to see us out here and it's just 
they would just do some racist, racist stuff. I don't, I don't, I know you might not want to hear it, but I'm calling it like I saw it. It's, Hold on, you see, this, this is your point of view. This is your time to shine. I'll never forget when I was getting off the bus, uh, a group of kids tried to come up to me and Ryan, and it, it was like, it was like six or seven of them, and then with their brother and stuff. And he, I think we were still in middle school, going into high school, and he was just, he was just older than us. But dude got on his knees and called us some nigglets or something like that, and he didn't think we was going, yeah, it was crazy. I wow. I'll never forget that. And then I'll never forget when I was in like tenth grade. It was all. It was like it was our first like when our first hurricanes dealing with down here, and we was just new to all the hurricane business. So we all slept in the living room together. The whole family, <laughs> we all slept in the living room together. <laughs> <laughs> Our dog Lane was outside, and she was barking a lot all night, but we thought she was just barking because of the storm. And we all slept in the living room because of the flood and stuff like that. Next morning, we get up, we go to school, and the way the driveway was set up, you're not, when you're coming out the house, you're not walking around the car, you're just walking straight to the driver's door. So yeah. you get in your car, you go all the way to work, the next city over, and mama get in her car and she go to Starbucks and Walmart. And then she coming out of was it Starbucks or Walmart or whatever one she came out last. She came out of and she seen the back of her car how it got scraped. And this was the day Obama got elected for yep. his first term. Obama yeah. got elected for his first term. He that night before he won, won the presidency. And then this night, the next day, when mama was leaving Walmart, the back of her car said, uh, nigger on it. Yep. Back in, and then you was rushing home to figure out what was going on. And people was looking at you crazy in traffic. And when you get, get almost home, you see in the back of your car, they wrote white power. Yeah. They spell white wrong. And they spell white wrong. Yeah. I, just, I do a joke about that on stage, too, by the way. But <laughs> see, a lot of people, and, and what, what really hurt me about, about not only that, is that people think that it wasn't real and that it didn't exist. And what was that, 2000 and what, six? I want to say six or seven. I, I think I have some pictures here. Yeah, I got them somewhere. In 2006, somebody literally spray painted white power and nigger on our cars. Real life, real life. And, and uh, my, my, my white friends showed me how to get it off the car. So, you know what I mean? So, irony. That, that, the irony, yes. So, that that's 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 what bothers me about the whole racism thing. Like, I could walk around here and and uh, get get mad and pointed out every time people don't think that it's real, but it's real. We got we have a list of stories that we can share. It's just one. And and, and, and let me let me ask you something. Does that make you a better person? Honestly, it made me, because we after that situation happened, remember we called the police and stuff, and they just basically looked at it and shrugged their shoulders. They didn't do nothing about it. There wasn't nothing they could do about it, basically. They didn't even try. So it just, it, it, it fuels me or motivates me to, that's the reason why I don't want to practice law, why I want to go to law school, practice litigation, criminal defense, and stuff like that. That's just, to finally apply a, a needed pressure on the people who do certain stuff like this, or so it can be some type of accountability okay. in these type of situations. So it just fuels me to do better because it's, like you said, it's not the that's not the only situation, but all those situations leading up until I was getting ready to go to college, that's what made me want to, you know, what uh, something's got to change. Somebody got to become responsible. Something. And you know what? And I'm, I'm very proud of you. That leads me to my uh, my next question. Uh, so, completely flipped. <laughs> you went from all white school to people spray painting white power and nigger on your family's car <laughs> to a HBCU. HBCU. You went to <laughs> Bethune Cookman University graduate. Uh, how was the shock? going from one extreme to the next and would you change change that opportunity had you had a, if, if you had a chance um i wouldn't change a thing because even though our school had uh at mitchell the high school had its prejudices and racism all that stuff going on 
at the school, I got a good, I received a good education. I remember I kept begging your mom, let me switch schools, y'all not let me switch schools, but at the end of the day, I got a great education from that school. I, I was I was up there, I got a really, really good education from that school. So when it was time for me to go to college, and I, I had guidance counselors telling me, oh, you won't be able to go to college, you should just go to community college. So it was just, I was so happy to, to even go to HBCU and be there and just to, it just made it so much easier for me because I just, it was certain stuff I already knew how to do because I got that education beforehand. So I wouldn't trade it for nothing because it just, it, it just made me, it made me want to embrace my culture even more. That's all it did. It just made me want to be embraced by my culture even more. If I only get four years to do it, that's fine. But I really, I said experience, I wouldn't trade for anything in the world. I encourage all the youth watching this to go to college, apply to college, go to college, meet your people up. Wow, we, we, we were so proud of you getting into college, man. And uh, <laughs> gra graduate with two degrees, you know, I was so proud. Like, that's that's my dude. I, it's my name is on the degree as well. So sometimes I use, sometimes I use it, you know. But uh, so just so, so, so proud of you. And I know you're not done yet. I, I know you have, uh, I know you have aspirations of Absolutely. Getting, getting into law. Uh, like, right, right now, I like to tell people, uh, I always tell people that uh, plans go out the window when you're trying to survive. That's like, that's, that's, a, that's a Ron Hortman quote, right? So, hey, that's real. I need to go on a t-shirt. <laughs> like, right, let's do that. Before we, tonight, let's do that. But like yeah. right now, right now, you're not where you want to be as far as your, uh, your legal career. But right now, you're doing something that I feel is amazing because it's something that I wanted to do and tell us a little bit about that like what are you doing right now as a professional and I, again I'm very proud I'm kind of biased uh, <laughs> my son but what are you doing now all right well now um after graduation I started uh working in the jail and all of that the juvenile jail and it didn't work out like I wanted to like you said plans go out the window when you're trying to survive and I, after graduation, I was trying to survive. Things didn't line up like that. I thought they would with me applying to law schools, thinking I could go directly in. And part of that's on me. I was trying to focus on so much different stuff at the time. But, uh, but at the same time, I, I, I didn't, how do I put this? I don't want to mess up. No, no, you say it's, it's, it's no, I, All right, well. It didn't go the way I wanted to. I had to move back home, and like I said, I was just trying to survive, trying to stay afloat, trying to keep things level. And then I was I had the opportunity of a job offer back in uh, Daytona, so I came out here to be a behavioral interventionist, and I applied. And I was waiting a minute for my uh, basically to get in and all the whole process to get in. And it's just I was just blessed for them to see my work ethic and see how I conduct myself and see how I how well I handled the kids at the school that I was offered the opportunity to get a raise and a promotion to take a teaching position. So now I'm teaching math, science, and speech and debate to grades 6 through 12 uh, youth at alternative school. So it's kids who are delinquent youth, basically. Before they transition back into their regular school, they I'm their math and science teacher. That's, man, I'm so proud of you, man. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm so, so proud. Like, a lot of people don't understand that teachers, uh, a lot of times teachers can reach people that that their parents can't reach them or their family can't reach them. It's that one teacher that strike that nerve in them and push them to greatness, man. And it takes a great person to be a teacher, man. And I'm I'm so so proud. And, <laughs> Thank you. I try my best. And also, I'm 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 glad you said that it didn't work out the way you wanted to work out. Like, you know what I'm saying? A lot of people need to hear that because yep. people, people, people give up on their dreams because it gets tough or it doesn't go the way they planned it. Life don't always go that way. And I've always encouraged y'all to uh, chase y'all dreams, being whatever it may be. You can do it. Don't let nobody tell you nothing. Like, I'm just gonna go back when we, we were teenagers People were telling us, like, when your mother was pregnant, it's never going to work. You're going to leave her. Uh, She's going to have that baby by herself and all that. Fast forward, 
we got four kids, two grandkids, and we lived happily ever after. You know what I mean? <laughs> Not to say that we didn't have any issues, but we, we had some, some detours along the way, but we were determined to have that. You know what I mean? And that, that rolls me right into my next question. Uh, being the environment that you were raised in, uh, the, uh, you seeing your parents together, I, I have a, uh, I, I've always wondered, how does that affect you on the <laughs> dating scene? I felt like I knew it was coming. Yes, how does that affect you on the dating scene? Okay. All right. Well, being like the environment I was raised in, I've seen, I've always seen my father loving my mother, my mother loving my father. I've never seen no physical altercations or my mom and dad calling the police. Oh, oh, oh. Your mama did hit me before. Just so you know, she did put her hands on me. But she I did. <laughs> We're just going to put that out there. All right. I didn't continue. See it. <laughs> but I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't see it. And uh, it's just, I, I'm I'm grateful that my parents loved each other, and that's all. That, I grew up in a household of love. Now I feel like I have a big heart, but now because I have such a big heart, I have to be cautious with how I deal with people in in this in this era, in this like in this social media era, this instant gratification era. So it just it reminded it reminded me that because when I was like certain relationships, I kind of want to work through it. Like, yeah, I always see my mom and dad, they work through anything. They, they made it work all the time. They always work through stuff. So it made me not want to give up on relationships quick, but it also made, it also reminded me to, that's not an excuse to hold on to something that needs to be letting go of or something like that. So it just, it changed my perspective on a lot of stuff. And then it, it, it kind of set a standard for when I'm meeting a, a, a woman Nowadays, if she's not, if she's doing like giving me certain stuff that my mom wouldn't do to my dad, or my dad wouldn't say to my mom, or my mom would say to my dad, it's kind of a red flag to me. That's kind of. Now I will, I, I will say that uh, it took us a long time to get there. I don't, I, I never want to paint the picture that we this perfect couple that we have problems. But as as your parent, we wanted to to shield y'all from all of the problems that we had. I, I I told it on one of my friend's shows, my friend had, he interviewed me on the shows, uh, that I remember I went out of town. I was in Atlantic City, I had shows, and y'all were getting home from school and you called me and you said, I think the storm put the lights out That, And I said, oh yeah, okay, well, just sit tight. It should come back on. And really, I didn't pay the light bill. Because I hadn't got, I hadn't had the money yet, so so I called and I paid it and got and, and got it on, and uh, and y'all never knew, and that's what we that's what we wanted to do. We wanted to protect y'all from that. We wanted y'all to have, uh, we wanted y'all to be kids, and we wanted y'all to. That's all we say. I want to enjoy your time as a kid. Enjoy being a kid. Don't grow up too fast. We want y'all to enjoy. Being that's the always tell us that. At the time, we didn't understand, but like growing up, it, it made so much more sense. And it was like, I'm glad I got to be a kid when it was time to be a kid because now I see adults who act like kids because they didn't get the chance to be a kid. They were just trying to be too busy, being too fast, and being too grown. So it's just, I appreciate that. Hey Amen. That's, that's, that's what it is, man. Uh, now, how is it, how is it uh, being that? Like part of me used to feel guilty because I was always I'd be on the road, uh, and I know people that had like one of my friends ran for governor. He legit ran for governor for the state of Wisconsin, and I'm on stage trying to tell jokes, and I'd be <laughs> like, uh, "How does that make you feel as a, a, a kid?" Like. Now you you see on TV well we you got your Dave Chappelle's your Kevin Hart's and all that these dudes that are mega stars, but then you see your father gonna be around the corner at the Chuckle Hut uh, <laughs> after he get off work and he's still telling these jokes. But I told myself I can't quit now. I'm telling them to chase their dreams. So if I quit, what am I telling them? So. I just never, I always wondered how did y'all feel as kids 
to have, you know, to have a parent chasing something like that. And that was that was something that makes me proud of you. Like you never stopped. That's something you don't you don't worry about the Kevin Hart's base pills all because you know it, it's gonna come. We always say it's gonna come. It's gonna come because you genuine, you funny, you real. It's we. I just it's gonna come, and it's just always that's something that made me proud of my dad. Because even though you say your your dad running from the governor or whatever, but forty nine other states can say that too. I don't know. So I make me feel like one in a million sometimes. Like, oh, what's your dad's name? You know, just type my name, man. You'll see him. <laughs> I, I love it. I love it. And then, like you said, that, that always inspired me to follow my dreams. It will get tough for me sometimes being sick, or when I would get sick, I'm missing a week, two weeks of school, and then I come back and I got to do makeup work for six classes and do current work for six classes all at the same time. And it's like, the thing that kept me motivated is to see my, my dad still chasing his dreams. He got all these hardships and all this stuff on him, but he don't, he don't fold ever. He don't, he just, that's the smartest person in the world to me, the funniest person in the world to me, and the realest person in the world to me. So I, I just looked at it as encouragement. It's, it's in my blood. You can do it. I can do it. I want to get on your level. But you got, you got your finger in so many different pies at once. I'm just trying to catch up to you, dad. Oh, wow. Um, don't, don't make me cry on my own thing. I can't cry. <laughs> on my own <laughs> podcast, all right? Now, we only got a few minutes left. Uh, I'm, I'm just thinking stuff as we go. What would you tell future Ron Hortman Jr. about accomplishing some goals? What would I tell future, future Ron Hortman Jr.? Future Ron Hortman Jr. Like, what I, like today, like if you get fast forward 10 years from now, because you know the meters fly by, 10 yeah. years from now, what would you tell future Ron Hortman Jr.? What would you tell him? It's crazy. You can really think about that. I've been out the house for about 10 years. I graduated. That's bad. Yeah. Yeah. Now you're putting the age on me. People didn't know. Now you're really doing it to me. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Junior. <laughs> I was just, I don't know. I think I would tell myself to, uh, don't just don't stress the stuff you can't control. Keep going, uh, keep pushing. Don't stress the stuff I can't control. Cause that's that don't do nothing but make me sick sometimes. So all that stressing for what? I'm gonna get it done. I know my mindset. No matter what everybody else thinks, I know my mindset. I know what I'm gonna do. So don't stress the little stuff. That's that's all I could really think to tell myself. Cause I don't know. I don't know how soon I'm gonna be there. Or how soon I'm not gonna be there. Just gonna trust the process. <laughs> How do you, how do you stay so positive, and you have you have this this condition? First of all, you got to go to work like everybody else. You're dealing with problems like everybody else. You're dealing with relationship stuff like everybody else. You're dealing with COVID nineteen right like everybody else. But on top of that, you have this sickle cell anemia, and then you're a black man. So a lot of people don't know this. When you go into the hospitals. A lot of times they're accusing you of coming to get drugs and all that. So you deal with all of that. How do you still remain positive? How? It's impossible. I always think about uh, that Bob Mar that Bob Marley quote where he uh, uh, it just reminds me sometimes where he says, uh, "All these wicked people in the world, they don't never take no rest. All these wicked people don't never take a rest. So somebody being positive and being good." Why would you take a rest? Why they don't take no days off? Why should I? So it's like, I just because if I sit and dwell in that too long, it'd get me upset. It'd make me too frustrated. It's just, there's no point in it. It's no, it doesn't bring me no benefit, no satisfaction. No, it's does nothing but hurt me. So I just, I've always been just, I always try to stay optimistic, right? And that's just part of my upbringing too. I didn't grow up in a, in a hostile environment or a hostile household or anything like that. It was always jokes and laughing and. Telling the next person you love them, I, don't, I never saw. I didn't think it was anything wrong with telling somebody you love them until I got to like high school and college and stuff. Like even like a friend or something. I just, I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> well, it's amazing, man. Like you, I always told you that uh, uh, you are really one of my heroes. Like I, I always say that because you di you deal with so much and you've accomplished so much where a lot of people I know 
And God bless them because they have conditions, but a lot of people, they'll use their conditions and they accept it and they make excuses. Or they use it as a, you know, I ain't got to do it. I got this. So that's, that's it is what it is. And when I would go to those, like, conferences and stuff sometimes, like, I would meet a lot of people who, who also have sickle cell and stuff like that. But it's just their mindset and perspective would kind of make – it kind of, like, it rubbed me the wrong way because it's like you're accepting it. You're just accepting the fact that, oh, they're telling you disabled, you can't do this, you can't do that. And it's like, I don't want to be like that. I don't want, if I can, I'm going to push the limit. I'm going to try to show you if you can. And you can do whatever you put your mind to. Like you said, I don't have to be strong in the body, I'm strong in the mind. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I think we have like two minutes left. Uh, I still don't even have a name for this uh, <laughs> this podcast that I'm going to be doing. Uh, this is my first one, and I appreciate you spending the time with me. Uh, it's, it's time. You know what I mean? If, uh, if you have some closing remarks, uh, I know you're a teacher, so <laughs> we got some students that might watch this. <laughs> we talked a little bit. We, we we briefly talked. So you had some challenges in your life. You're still dealing with challenges. You you continuously overcome. You keep a positive attitude. So speak to the youth right now that are going through something. What would you tell them? Um, to the youth, I would say, like no matter what you're going through. You just gotta, you gotta always just look on the brighter side. That's how I look at it. You gotta look, find that, find that silver line and find the brighter side. Find the, what's the word I'm looking for? Find the, uh, the incentive behind it or something. Like just, I was just wouldn't dwell on, on too much bad stuff or stuff that bothers you too much. And sometimes you can't. Sometimes you can't. Sometimes you got no control over that type of stuff. But you do have control over your mind. So you just don't. Don't don't let it eat away or fester at you. Now, if anybody ever wants to talk, I you can always reach out to me. I'm the type of person I don't, I, I don't mind. Even if you don't know me, I don't mind sharing stories and wisdom back and forth with somebody. So I I can't I, I can't really I don't know I can't think of a blanket statement to say that everybody because so many different so many situations are different. My situation is different for so many different people. So it's like all I can say is just stay stay positive in this in this time of uncertainty. That's a beautiful statement. I'll leave, I'm going to leave everybody with this. Uh, thank you all for listening. Uh, it was a very proud moment for me to sit and have an adult conversation with my <laughs> oldest son. I would say, uh, as long as there's life, there's hope. That's what something my daddy used to tell me. So I believe that. Uh, thank you all for listening. Ron Hortman and Ron Hortman Jr. Uh, <laughs>